Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today with Baptiste, I'm going to uh, present you Bad Memory. For those who wonder, uh, Gustav is not here today. He had visa, visa issues, so he's stuck in uh, Stockholm. So, Bad Memory is a uh, talk a little bit different from what you might have seen before. Uh, we try to give you something which is out of the box thinking, and we're going to show you a lot of cool attacks. And we have made a lot of video for you because. Uh, Usually the god of demo are against me, so now I'm doing video. Uh, they are on YouTube, so if you want to, to watch the video afterward, you can just browse the channel and you have them. Uh, so, usually, uh, and you're all there for uh, security, uh, there is three ways we can know and know how to break a security mechanism. Uh, the first one is when you find a uh, design flow. Uh, for instance, web is broken because of by design. You all know that, and you also have uh, the most well-known way, which is we try to find exploit and uh, find vulnerability into the code, its implementation. And the third one, which would be the focus of this talk, is how you can try to make uh, this security mechanism a little bit irrelevant. Closer. Okay. Sorry. So, what do we mean by irrelevant? Uh, for a second, bear with me. Uh, let's assume you have this nice house in Wonderland, and uh, of course you like your house, so you're going to prevent people to try to break through it. Uh, the, way, the way you do that is you have a nice security mechanism, which is a door. So the, the bigger the door, the more secure you are. But the, a clever attacker might try to do uh, what we call side channel, and that would be the focus of this talk, is try to break through the windows, or try to break through the roof, right? So that's the, what we call side channel. Now what we're going to tell you is not about Wonderlot, it's, it's about real security. So what we have is uh, four different stories in this talk. So the first one would be how you can actually break into a WPA network from a web page. The second one would be how you can attack HTTPS with cache injection. The third one would be how you can steal private data f with what we call framework attack. And the third one would be how to attack uh, this guy, smartphone. Uh, with something which is a so new generation of clickjacking. So, well, uh, hope we will be as loud as this guy. Uh, so, uh, over, the day, over the year, uh, we, we see something which is really good. Uh, we see people moving away from web, or at least they should, from something which is more secure, which is WPA, right? And so the world is more secure, and even at the DEF CON this year, we have a secure network, so the world of ship is kind of empty now. But, hey, still something remains. Uh, we are still storing the WPA key through a web interface. And our idea was, well, maybe we can't break WPA because we don't really know how to do that right now, but we probably can try to attack this web interface. And to confirm that, we went to a store and buy like a, lot, a huge bunch of routers from different brands, eight of them, and try to our hypothesis. And the result with that we're able to break all of this brand and actually retrieve the WPA key. What I'm going to show you now is how we do that. So. The so basic idea of this attack is we are able to execute a malicious JavaScript uh, inside the local network because a user is browsing the web. It's not an unusable assumption. First reason is because a lot of websites have XSS vulnerability. Go to XSSD, the website, if you not trust me. There is a ton of them. But also because you can serve ads. And actually, ads contain uh, malicious code. It's well known. Uh, for instance, uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, Avas released a, a study which shows that a lot of uh, advertisement networks did a very bad job at sanitizing the advertisement. And as a result, there is a lot of malware which are distributed via ad network. In case you wonder how much it costs, if you want to have 100,000 impressions, it's about $100. So it's a really cost effective attack. Um, how many of you are familiar with what we call uh, the browser same origin policy? Raise your hand. Not that much people. Okay, so just make sure everyone is on the page and will follow what we're going to explain. The so same origin policy is uh, one of the key security mechanisms you have in the browser. It's basically meant to protect you when you are browsing multiple websites at the same time because you have multiple tabs or you have one iframe inside uh, your page. The basic idea is the following. If you have two origin in the screen, you have evil.com and you have uh, mail.google.com. Uh, the same origin policy do something very simple. 
which is you can one origin can post data doesn't mean that the other origin has to process them but you can post data from one origin to another that's how web service can interact together but you are not able from one origin to read the other one which effectively prevents a bad guy to read your uh, gmail or a malicious page to read your bank account right that's the same origin policy so we can post data provided there is no CSR defense but we can't actually read data and you will see that it actually makes this attack a little bit hard and that's a major hurdle we had to work around. Okay, so back to the attack. The attack works as follows. At the beginning the attacker will uh, pay ads or uh, find an XSS in a well-known website and will be able to uh, inject a malicious JavaScript inside the local network. At this point, uh, you have to realize that the firewall is completely useless. There is not any more uh, firewall because you are already inside the network. Similarly, you might say, hey, the router interface is only available from inside the network. Well, that's not an issue because we are already inside so we can access from the browser of the user the, the, root, the web interface. So the first thing we have to do, the so first thing that this uh, malicious ad has to do is to locate uh, the IP of the router because we have no clue of that. A good way to do that is to look at the R RFC and try all the probable IP. We do that by using such a request which is an asynchronous request. And we try to see the page load or not. If the page load then there is a web interface and it's likely that it's a router. So we go uh, to common IP and until we find uh, the right one. Okay. So at that point uh, there is two kind of routers in the world. One which is uh, web authentication or web login which is the same thing you see on Facebook, Gmail, all that kind of stuff. It's basically a, uh, an authentication where you have the username and password which is inside the HTML form. The, old w the other w type of authentication is the one you had in previous uh, life or when one web 1.0 which was you know the basic authentication. It's an ugly pop up you have with username and password. And we can have to know which one you are using because if you are using uh, a basic auth, we can't really try to brute force it. And the type of attack is a little bit different. And once again, the same origin policy prevents us to read the page. So we don't have any idea which kind of authentication is used. Fortunately for us, uh, we found uh, one or two bugs in Firefox. They are currently reported. And we're, we are able to know with 100% accuracy because of this bug whether which kind of authentication you, you are using. Uh, so when we know which authentication you are using, what we are doing is what we call fingerprinting the router. We need to know which model and which brand you have because each brand and each model have a different kind of vulnerability. To do that we do one, two, one, two tricks. The first one is really well known is we try to uh, fetch well known image from the, from the routers. Every brand has a different logo which has a different size so we can fit them in JavaScript and read the properties to get an idea of which image are present. Uh, the other one which we come up with is actually to defeat the basic code idea which is if you have a basic code, if you are mistaken you will see an ugly pop up and the user will click cancel and you're dead. So we're doing port scanning because you can do that with uh, XHR requests. XHR requests are not ban bound to a specific port. You can do a lot of them except some specific one like support SMTP port. So with this we first do a, a first pass of scanning the, all the ports get an idea of what Twitter you might have and do further fingerprinting with image. As a result, we can tell uh, which one are positive, which one are negative and have a pretty good idea of who you are. Actually in our implementation we have a fingerprinting which works 100% and we were able to actually know each brand and each model at 100% accuracy. When we are at this point, what we have to do is uh, authenticate to the router. Remember, the router is protected by a password. So before I'm going a little bit further, how many of you uh, ever changed the router password at home? All of you. Fantastic. <laughs> I don't trust you. <laughs> no, seriously, I don't. But okay, let's let's assume you are all making the right choice. And of course, let me raise your hand. Who chose a password which is more than 10 characters? Raise all your hand. Come on. Okay, right. So everyone has a secure, strong password, never use one time password only for their home router, right? Well, the nice thing for us is if we is a default password doesn't work, what we can do is we can actually brute force it for two reasons. The first one is this kind of router do not have a CSRF defense, so we are able to try as many logins as we want. 
and we're able to inject page from the malicious JavaScript to the router. And the second one is we know we are successfully logged or not by using what we call timing attack. So a timing attack is the idea that if the page is not logged, you only see login and password, which is really fast to display. So the loading time will be really, really fast in the order of 300 milliseconds. If we are logged, there is a ton of stuff like uh, basic setup, router setup, wireless setup. You know, this all huge page, so which take about one second and to one second and a half. Since we are on a local network, it's really reliable because we don't have any latencies. Remember, it's from the router to the to the browser, which is inside the local network. So the latency doesn't play a role here. So we can do a good guess. If you are using basic code, and that's kind of the irony of the story, is I, basic code is more secure because we have only one try. We don't have a way to brute force basic code because we have no way to actually tell whether you're successful or not. And we, if we fail, we have a pop-up. We found a way at some point to actually remove the pop-up, but we can't still know whether it's successful or not. So. Well, in any case, uh, we are able to brute force most of the router which moves to the web uh, authentication part, uh, web login form. And as a bonus point, at some point we, were, we had one which was uh, even better, is we tried to authenticate and from somehow our code was messed up and Batty showed me say, hey, it's still working. And we were looking at each other and we're, what happened? Actually, some of the router actually do not enforce permission so you can actually fa inject uh, anything you want in it without supplying password. Not going to tell you which brand because otherwise everyone is going to throw them away. Uh, but yeah, very, very famous brand. So once again, even if we are able to be authenticated to the to the router, we have no uh, no way to um, to read directly the page which contains the WPA key, right? So at that point, we have to find new vulnerability, and this time we found vulnerability inside the routers. And what we're going to use is we're going to use XSS vulnerability. We found five out of the eight we looked at has XSS vulnerability. And what we're going to do is very simple. We're going to inject a payload, which is an external JavaScript. And this external JavaScript will be injected into the router, and we can do that because, uh, once again, there is no CSRF defense, so there is no check where, where the input came from. Um, so some of you might wonder here, well, this might work, so you can have an injection, but what about if the injection is not in the right page? So usually when we found uh, an XSS is not on the page which has a WPA key. Well, uh, it doesn't matter because we have what we call cross-contamination, cross origin, uh, contamination, origin contamination, which means that uh, if you have an XSS in one page, we can use that to actually open an iframe, and this iframe would be inside the same origin. So this time the same origin policy doesn't prevent us to read inside the iframe. And from this, we are just able to read the key. And at this point, uh, we're almost done. It's almost mission complete because nothing prevents us to send back the, the key to home to the attacker, right? So you might wonder, well, what happens if you can't uh, find an XSS vulnerability? Well, there is two things for you here. The first is you can use click jacking, and we found that uh, most of any router do not have any click jacking defense, so you can use a trick found by Paul Stone, showing that the black hat should up to a 10, which is a drag and drop click jacking. If you can lure the user into drag and dropping, which is not that hard, uh, think of making a fake game, then you can extract any data you want from a page. So all you have to do is frame the page and have the user do a drag and drop, for example, feeding a puppy or uh, moving around their mouse or whatever. And we found that eight of the router, eight of out of eight router have never to that. And uh, two days ago, uh, Craig Efner also showed that you can use DNS rebinding attack to actually access the page from outside, so you can do this as well. And so you have the key, right? So the key is gone, and we have one problem. Do you, can you guess what it is? Well, I have a key, but where is the network, right? You have a nice key, a long key, and the key doesn't tell you much where the, where the router is. So we have the key. We don't know where the, the router is. Well, it turns out that there is an app for that. And, uh, <laughs> and actually, it's a courtesy of Firefox. So Firefox did introduce, for those who don't know that, uh, in 3.5, I guess, something which is called the location aware browsing. So what it looks like, for those who never see it, is it's a little pop-up on the top which says, do you want to share your location with the page? It's used to give you, to give the page information of who you, where you are so they can provide you more relevant information like uh, restaurant or place to go to. And under the hood, what it happened is they are partnership with Google and Google uses this little car you see on the bottom.
which are touring all the cities in the world and gathering a lot of information. And there were a lot of discussion whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for Google to collect that much data. Well, this is one example of where this data is actually harmful. So what happened under the hood, and it's also has been found by uh, Sami Kemvar, which do I think a talk here, which is uh, how I met your girlfriend. Uh, the idea is that uh, Google, you can, there is a protocol with 